Hello, class. Are you ready to science? Good. I'm Dr. Mo, and I'm hoping to help you become more interested in science because our planet is full of many curious and unexpected things, and science is often our only way to learn about them. For today's class, we're going to be talking about something very exciting. It's hydrothermal vents. Yes, hydrothermal vents are sort of like deep ocean hot springs. They are a type of deep sea environment that occurs in areas with volcanic activity where there is magma nearer to the surface. For a hydro hydrothermal vent to form, seawater, and this is the hydro part, must seep through fissures in the ocean floor, where it is heated by magma, and this is the thermal part. And then the water returns to the ocean floor through a process called convection where hot water has a lower density, and so it rises to the surface. And this hot water escapes back into the sea to form a vent. The water that returns through the vent can reach temperatures of 400 degrees Celsius. That's more than 700 degrees Fahrenheit. But you might ask, doesn't water boil and turn into steam at 100 degrees Celsius? Well, we'll save that discussion for the following lecture. Uh, most importantly, the water that returns through the vent also carries dissolved minerals. These minerals are collected from rocks that the superheated water passed through as it traveled from the region near the magma back towards the surface. And as a result, the fluids that are vented into the bottom of the ocean in these environments often look sort of smoky, especially compared to the seawater. Most of the minerals being transported by the water are sulfides. This just means the minerals have the element sulfur as a major component. Some examples of sulfide minerals that you may have heard of are things like pyrite, which is iron disulfide, cinnabar, which is mercury sulfide, and the shiny mineral galena, which is lead sulfide. Hot water coming from the vent filled with dissolved minerals, enters into the water at the bottom of the ocean, which is nearly freezing. And this causes the minerals to quickly precipitate. In other words, they become solid. And as a result, they get deposited there. And well, eventually they form a cone or a chimney shaped structure like these. There are actually two types of hydrothermal vents that can form, and the mineral composition of a hydrothermal vent actually uh, determines what type of vent is created. If the dissolved minerals that come up from the magma are mostly iron sulfides, they'll have a darker appearance, and the smoke and resultant chimney structures black colored, and these are called black smokers. Black smokers are actually the most common type of hydrothermal vent system. And if the dissolved minerals are mostly barium or calcium or silicon, well, the chimneys that form are white colored. And well, these are called, as you might guess, white smokers. <laughs> 
And white smokers tend to be a little bit cooler in temperature, and also, as you can see, a little bit smaller. These two types of hydrothermal vents are often associated with each other. They're found together in the same hydrothermal vent systems, but in the hotter areas that are closer to the center of the magma bodies or where the crust is thinner, black smokers will form. And usually on the margins of this environment, where the vented water is a little cooler, these white smokers will form. Okay, so hydrothermal vents were completely unknown to man until 1977, when they were first discovered near the Galapagos Islands. But their initial discovery led scientists to become curious and to look elsewhere, and they quickly found many other hydrothermal vent systems. And now, scientists have observed more than 500 hydro hydrothermal vent communities distributed throughout the oceans. Now, of course, one of the most amazing parts about hydrothermal vent systems is that compared to the surrounding ocean floor, hydrothermal vents support a diverse group of organisms. At least initially, this challenged our idea of deep ocean floors as dark, uninhabited landscapes. But the location of hydrothermal vents are somewhat patchy in distribution. They are often associated with what we call mid-ocean ridges, and they have vast areas between the sites where no vents actually occur. You can think of them a little bit like undersea islands. Most of the organisms in the vent communities are dependent upon the fluids from the vent, and they can't easily migrate from one vent to another. Well, at least not as adults. This is because most of the vent community organisms can't persist in the landscape between the vents. They are what we call endemic. In other words, they are limited in their distribution to the hydrothermal vent environments themselves. Hydrothermal vents are also inherently transient environments. They form mostly at tectonic spreading centers in the ocean floor where the magma is closer to the Earth's surface. And how long a, hydro vent will, a hydrothermal vent will persist depends on how quickly the underlying tectonic plates are spreading. And along these mid-ocean ridges in the Atlantic Ocean, particularly where it spreads very slowly, some of the vent communities may be several thousand years old. But in some places in the Pacific Ocean, the hydrothermal vent environments and the communities that occupy them form and then collapse, sometimes in less than a hundred years. This is one hazard that's associated with building your community around a shallow magma body. It's that often vent communities will meet a fiery end. Sometimes the entire vent system is destroyed by volcanic eruptions on the seafloor. And if they aren't destroyed by the actual outpouring of lava, well, the associated earthquakes can sometimes also lead to their collapse. As I mentioned, the vent water can be more than 400 degrees Celsius. So how are so many organisms living in these ecosystems? Are all of these organisms extremophiles like those that we talked about in the lecture from last week? This is perhaps one of the biggest misconceptions about hydrothermal vents.
It turns out that because the seawater at the bottom of the ocean is cold, it is so cold that when the hot vent water enters it, it cools very, very quickly. And this means that really not very far from the vent at all, the ocean water temperatures are probably closer to something like 20 degrees Celsius. It's essentially slightly cooler than the room temperature, probably where you are right now, which is to say it's not at all extreme, even on human terms. Okay, so no big deal, right? Most of the organisms probably aren't thermophiles, although some of them definitely are. So what makes this environment so special? Well, for one, this environment is deep below the sea, and often they occur way below the point where light reaches the bottom. And if there's no light, well, this means there's no plants and no algae. These are the organisms that photosynthesize and which make up the base of our food web. And they're strictly missing from these environments. So what the heck is everything that lives here eating? Well, let's talk a little bit about light first. And this will become more interesting later, I promise. Light is part of the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, which encompasses everything from, say, radio waves, which have very long wavelengths, to microwaves, to parts of the spectrum that have very, very short wavelengths, such as X-rays and gamma rays. So what's the difference between visible light and, say, infrared light? or ultraviolet light. Just the wavelength, right? But what about light waves and, say, radio waves? Well, this might surprise you, but everything that is part of the electromagnetic spectrum is fundamentally made up of the same things. Photons. Photons are what we call massless particles that are moving in a wave-like pattern at the speed of light. So I'm telling you that radio waves and x-rays and gamma rays are all actually photons? Yep. But you might ask, we, we can cook food with microwaves, right? So why can't we cook our food with visible light? Well, in fact, you could if you concentrated enough of the photons in one place. For example, did you ever wonder what happens when a magnifying glass is used to focus sunlight? What you're actually doing is increasing the concentration of photons in one place. And if the concentration of photons is high enough, then of course visible light can indeed be used to burn things. However, all of these different types of electromagnetic radiation have different wavelengths. And the wavelengths determine how much energy the photons have. So simply put, radio waves have longer wavelengths and low energies, that is per photon, and microwave photons have a little bit more energy, and infrared photons have a little bit more, and then there's visible light, UV, X-rays, gamma rays, and these are the most energetic and the shortest wave frequencies for photons. So human eyesight, I mean our eyesight, is limited, for the most part, to the visible light spectrum. And this is usually defined as photons with wavelengths ranging from around 380 to, say, 780 nanometers. 
Did you ever wonder, why is this the case? In fact, why are most mammals only sensitive to photons with wavelengths in this particular range? Well, would it surprise you to know that water is essentially opaque to most of the electromagnetic spectrum? Except, as you might suspect, for visible light. And this means that only the visible light part of the electromagnetic spectrum is actually useful to most underwater environments. All other wavelengths are basically blocked or absorbed very quickly underwater. And where did the first vertebrates evolve on Earth? Well, with fish in the oceans underwater. And so, yes, I hate to break this to you, but well, humans are basically fish. Or well, humans are fish in the same way that birds are dinosaurs. I mean, humans may not look much like a fish, but we have traits that first evolved in organisms that were unambiguously fish, including our vertebrate skeletons. So here's an artist's sketch of one of those early fish on Earth from about 518 million years ago. Did you know some human children are, on rare occasions, even born with gills? Their gills don't actually function, of course. They aren't Aquaman or The Deep from that Amazon series. Okay, but the eyesight? Well, it developed mostly before these fish-like organisms evolved and moved on to land. In other words, in underwater environments, where mostly photons with wavelengths of the visible light spectrum are the only ones that penetrate for more than a meter into the water. So, in any case, uh, all of the visible light spectrum doesn't actually penetrate into water at the same depth. Visible light with longer wavelengths, such as red and orange light, are usually actually absorbed within the first 40 meters or so of the water. Visible light in the blue and green wavelengths are a bit more high energy and they scatter in the water, but as a result, they can reach much greater depths. And it's this scattering of blue light in the water that is, of course, why water appears blue to us. So by 100 meters below the water surface in the ocean, only about 1% of the original visible light still remains. However, no trace of sunlight exists at depths in the ocean greater than about a thousand meters. Okay, so that seems like a pretty long detour to come around to just saying that it is very dark, very deep under the water, but this is important because the average depth of a hydrothermal vent is more than 2,000 meters under the ocean. And this means that most hydrothermal vents mostly occur where there's no sunlight at all. And no sunlight means no photosynthesis. So how do organisms at hydrothermal vents get energy? Well, some bacteria, like these shown here, have developed a special way to acquire food that we call chemotrophy. And this means surviving on food from chemical reactions. And the process is called chemosynthesis. So you can think of it like photosynthesis, but instead of using light, they use chemical reactions to help produce sugars for energy. Chemically, these sugars are a combination of uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. 
And well, there are many reactions that can be used to produce this, but the materials that are actually available at hydrothermal vents are mostly carbon dioxide and water and hydrogen sulfide. So most chemotrophic bacteria will strip the hydrogen that's required to produce the sugar from hydrogen sulfide. And that's the stuff that the vent waters carry. These chemotrophic bacteria are, in hydrothermal vents, the true base of the food pyramid. Hydrothermal vent communities, these isolated, diverse, hot spring islands on the ocean floor are for the most part supported entirely by bacteria that are thriving on hydrogen sulfide, super heated fluids coming out into the ocean water. I, I think now would be a good time to mention that for most organisms, hydrogen sulfide is extremely toxic. How toxic? After inhaling a single breath of hydrogen sulfide with a concentration over one part in a thousand, a human being will immediately collapse and stop breathing. Hydrothermal fluids usually have concentrations that are somewhere around about half of that, or 0.5 parts per thousand. But in some cases, these can actually spike to values that are 3.5 parts per thousand or higher during some magmatic events. Okay, so these bacteria are pretty impressive. But when most people think of hydrothermal vents, they're more commonly thinking of these bizarre macroorganisms that make up these communities. Probably the most iconic of these is the giant tube worm which was discovered at the very first hydrothermal vents back in 1977. Most of the giant tube worms grow within some sort of protective tube that they secrete. And you can see those here as this sort of tree-like thing that's wrapped around the base of these worms. And peeking out the top of the tube, they have bright red, feather-like gills, and the red color in these gills comes from hemoglobin, the same type of iron-rich protein that carries oxygen in human, I, I mean, our blood. These, these worms get their nutrients from chemotrophic bacteria, but not in the way that most organisms do. In fact, Giant tube worms like these have no mouth, no anus, and no digestive system at all. Nothing enters or exits. Giant tube worms do, however, have some sort of a gut-like thing that scientists call a trophosome. Uh, but nestled within this trophosome, Perhaps you've guessed it. There are chemotrophic bacteria. So just like you, there are bacteria living in the guts of these organisms. But unlike you, these bacteria for the tube worm are their only source of energy. The bacteria aren't being consumed though. They are living together within the tube worms effectively acting as a single organism. The giant tube worms do not eat, they do not poop, they do not even digest things. And without the chemotrophic bacteria, these giant tube worms could not live at all. So are they really just one organism? Giant tube worms have different life stages, and as adults, they live attached in these tubes to hydrothermal vents. But 
as juveniles, giant tube worms live as plankton. And, well, as plankton, they have no way to control their destiny. They float along with the deep sea currents, hoping to be carried to another hydrothermal vent environment so that they can colonize it. And in this life stage, they aren't living in hydrothermal vents, so there is no chemotrophic bacteria in their environments. And in fact, people have checked. The juvenile, bac uh, juvenile uh, tube worms have no bacteria living in their bodies at all. And if they happen to be carried by those currents to a suitable hydrothermal vent environment, well, then they will acquire chemotrophic bacteria from that environment. Something that's curious about the giant tube worms is they actually have the fastest growth rate of any known marine invertebrate. And in less than two years, a giant tube worm can arrive at a new hydrothermal vent as a juvenile, colonize it, acquire chemotrophic bacteria, reach maturity, and grow more than 1.5 meters in length. When you cannot live without the presence of another organism, and both organisms will benefit, in ecology, we refer to this as obligate, or in other words, required, mutualism. Mutualism is a special type of symbiosis where multiple organisms are living together as one, where both organisms benefit from the relationship. It's somewhat obvious how the tube worm benefits in this system because the bacteria are providing the tube worm with a constant source of energy for the worm within its body. It doesn't need to seek food. It doesn't need to deal with waste products. But how does this benefit the bacteria? Well, you know those bright red gills on the tube worm? The ones that deliver the sulfur-rich water to the inside of the worm? Well, that's what the bacteria need in order for chemosynthesis to occur. And on top of this, when that process happens, there's a byproduct of sulfur, and the tube worm actually removes this as a waste product. So in this case, both organisms benefit greatly, but not all symbiosis is beneficial. Some organisms are what we call parasitic. And there's things like this, such as virus, where the host is damaged or in some cases killed but it benefits the parasite. Uh, just as a side note, viruses are present in high concentrations in hydrothermal vents. And you might be surprised to hear this, but viruses are in fact the most abundant life form in the ocean. And while we can't see them easily, viruses are involved with most biological processes in the ocean. In in normal settings, viruses are really a significant source of mortality in ocean organisms. And the viruses found at hydrothermal vents, however, well, they're very curious. Instead of killing or damaging the hosts in a parasitic relationship, many viruses in hydrothermal vents have apparently adopted a different strategy. One observed almost nowhere else on Earth. In hydrothermal vent environments, many viruses actually seem to enhance the host and enhance its fitness by boosting the metabolism of the organisms. In other words, they have a mutualistic rather than a parasitic relationship. Why though? Well, in extreme environments such as hydrothermal vents, killing or weakening your host probably substantially reduces your own survival rate. So deep sea hydrothermal vents are really unique environments and 
the fauna that's found at each vent may even be fairly different from one vent to the next. So, for example, those giant tube worms that I was talking about, well, they're common in the vent communities in the Pacific Ocean. But they're pretty rare elsewhere. In the vents in the Indian Ocean, however, there is an endemic vent snail called the scaly foot gastropod. And just like the giant tube worm, once that snail reaches a post-larval stage, it also acquires chemosynthetic bacteria. The digestive system of this crazy beast is about 10% the size of other snails. And while it has the sort of rasping mouth parts which most snails usually use to scrape algae or dig holes in other organisms, well, it's underdeveloped and basically unused. And that's because the scaly foot gastropod, it doesn't eat. All of its nutrition is gained from its symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that live inside of it, just like the tube worm. These snails are sometimes called sea pangolin. Uh, the unique feature of this snail uh, includes the fact that the outer layer of the, of the shell, which you can see here, is actually composed of iron sulfides. And in other words, pyrite or fool's gold. Uh, it's compared to the pangolin because the foot of the snail is also covered with those small metallic armored plates, similar to a pangolin. And the sea pangolin is actually the only known living animal that will incorporate pyrite into its skeleton. Deep sea hydrothermal vents are also home to a unique group of crabs, the so-called Yeti crab, for, I hope, what is obvious reasons. But although it is called a crab, the Yeti crab is actually something that's called a squat lobster. But these are a group of lobsters that are actually more closely related to crabs than they are to true lobsters. Well, in any case, the first species of Yeti crab was described in 2005 from a hydrothermal vent in the Pacific near Easter Island. And Yeti crabs have a unique anatomy. They have this white color, they have no eyes, and they have these long, furry, clawed arms. Yeti crabs have been observed doing some sort of a weird dance where they wave their long furry arms near the hydrothermal vent fluids. But one problem with this is getting too close to the vent could kill them and they can't see. So what, what are they doing waving their arms in some sort of weird dance around these vent fluids that are potentially deadly to them? Well, the fur on their arm is actually something called setae. And the setae are home to, you guessed it, chemosynthetic bacteria. But in this case, the relationship is not symbiotic. The Yeti crabs are thought to prune the bacteria from their furry arms and then graze on it. Okay, so these ones are super cool with their weird wavy arms and their big fur hanging off the front of their arms, but a few years later, some more species of Yeti crabs were found, including this one. This one is known as the Hoff crab, and instead of furry arms, the Hoff crab has, well, it got its common name from David Hasselhoff, 
And that's because it's furry, cite covered chest, which it, yes, picks through in order to eat the bacteria that grow there. I bet when you tuned into this lecture, you didn't think I was going to say, this crab named after David Hasselhoff picks through its chest hair and eats it for dinner. Okay, uh, so for brief periods, Yeti crabs can withstand water that's pretty warm temperatures, but like the sea pangolins and the giant tube worms, Yeti crabs aren't really extremophiles. And, well, really, are any of these multicellular animals living in these very warm waters? Or really, are they just kind of living next to it? Are they just using the hydrothermal vents for a source of food and otherwise basically stay away from the hot parts of the vent itself? Well, meet the Pompeii worm. It is a deep sea polychaete worm that resides in tubes near hydrothermal vents. Beautiful, isn't she? Uh, and they happen to be one of the most heat resistant animals on earth. The base of the tube that the Pompeii worm lives in is where their tails are usually located and it regularly reaches temperatures of 80 degrees Celsius. Over short periods, Pompeii worms can handle being exposed to temperatures that are as high as 105 degrees Celsius. Yes, five degrees Celsius hotter than boiling water. And this places them second in terms of animals that can handle high temperatures to only the water bears in the animal kingdom. But as we have dis discussed before, water bears can only accomplish this in their dormant state. And the Pompeii worm, well, she doesn't have a dormant state. So how does this little worm manage to survive water at boiling temperatures? Well, the answer is, once again, symbiosis. In this case, a form of mutualism. There are tiny glands on the back of the Pompeii worm, and they secrete a sugary mucus. And this mucus is used as a food source for sulfur-loving bacteria. And in return, the bacteria appear to form a fleece-like covering on the back of the worm. So what you're seeing isn't really fur so much as a bacterial mat that's growing there. And this sort of fleece-like covering actually acts to insulate the worm from heat. Pompeii worms, like many of the organisms that live in hydrothermal vents, they get by with a little help from their friends. Okay. Let's discuss one more really interesting organism for this lecture. And, well, then we will save some for another lecture later on, perhaps. Okay. At some hydrothermal vents, scientists were sampling the organisms there, and they found a small living colony of green sulfur bacteria. That's this guy. And it's a microscopic organism. It's what we call anaerobic, which means they don't require any oxygen to be present in the environment where they live. But, and here's the catch, green sulfur bacteria are what is known as obligate photosynthesizers. In other words, some organisms can function as a chemotroph most of the time, but when sunlight is available, they can use it to supplement their energy, and they'll use the sunlight to make the food. But green sulfur bacteria cannot, 
they require light in order to grow. They are not chemotrophs. They can only live growing on light, and without light, they cannot live. So they're a little different from plants and algae in that they can grow at very, very low light levels. But as we already discussed, at the depths we're talking about, where hydrothermal vents usually occur, there isn't any sunlight. And it is definitely not enough light from the sun to grow organisms that require photosynthesis. Even those that can handle very low light couldn't grow here. So how can these green sulfur bacteria that require sunlight be living in a colony in this environment? Well, to understand what's happening, we need to revisit our discussion, the one about electromagnetic radiation, just a little bit. So most of you probably know what infrared light is. It is just photons that are moving at wavelengths that are slightly longer than visible light, right? We've, we've already discussed this. But you probably know infrared light mostly because we use it in common household items like remote controls, for example, and um, toasters. Oh, okay. Well, you might not have known that one, but toasters actually cook your bagels using infrared light. Infrared light is, for the most part, invisible to humans. We could see infrared light if we had special cameras, for example, like this, that would allow us to see something like a cat out of this image. And that's because heat is the primary source for infrared radiation. And in most cases, the warmer something is, the more infrared wavelength photons will be given off by it. So, are you radiating photons right now? Well, I hope so. Many organisms have a special sensor that's used to detect photons in the infrared wavelength spectrum. These include things like pit vipers and bed bugs and vampire bats and mosquito, well, mosquitoes. I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure why all of the animals in that list seem so unpleasant, but they can all detect at least part of the infrared light spectrum and they use it to see things. Oh, wait, uh, right. You'll recall from our last lecture on extremophiles, goldfish also can use infrared light. So I guess that makes that list a little bit more bearable anyhow. Okay. So uh, let's get to the interesting part. Um, I, I mean, I did promise you that all of this would sort of come back around and make some sense as to why we're talking about light so much. Okay, so uh, hydrothermal vent fluids are, as I mentioned, very, very hot. And this means that they actually radiate a lot of infrared radiation, mostly in the form of heat, but also as photons. We call this geothermal radiation, right? Okay. So the amount of infrared light being generated by hydrothermal vents is actually extremely small. But the presence of living colonies of green sulfur bacteria in these environments suggest that it must in fact be just enough light for some life forms to actually eke out a living. So in some of the deepest, darkest places in the bottom of the ocean, somehow photosynthesis is still a thing. Okay, so hydrothermal vent environments are filled with some fascinating and honestly pretty bizarre creatures. But um, one thing that many of them showcase for us and I hope 
that you've seen that in this lecture is an idea in ecology that largely stems from exploring extreme environments. And this is a concept we call facilitation. Facilitation is when one species can have a positive impact on the survival fitness of another species in an environment they would not normally be able to manage without. In other words, the presence of these microbes that can withstand these extreme temperatures, such as bacteria that compose the fuzzy backs of the Pompeii worm or facilitate facilitate the, the food for the, the uh, giant tube worms and the sea pangolins. Well, the fitness of those organisms in this environment is dependent upon that bacteria's presence. And so the symbiotic relationship between chemotrophs and sea pangolins and giant tube worms or, or any other organisms that have this sort of symbiosis is a form of of facilitation. Another aspect of hydrothermal vents that is often discussed and why we are so interested in sort of exploring these and many other extreme environments on earth is that life in hydrothermal vents may provide us with some clues about how early organisms on earth lived or maybe even evolved before we had oxygen-rich atmosphere, before we had cool oceans, before we had an ozone to protect us from ultraviolet radiation. And, well, they may also provide us with some clues about how life may survive on other planets. Okay, well, there are there will probably be uh, a return to hydrothermal vents in a later lecture because there are far too many interesting organisms in these environments to discuss in just one session. So I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. And if you have questions that I can answer, I'll give it a shot now. And if I don't know the answer, as always, we can try to figure them out and maybe I can answer them for you during my office hours tomorrow night. So, are there any questions? No? All right then, I guess that's it class here dismissed. Uh, our next topic, which I'm considering at the moment, will probably be immortality. I mean, why not? We'll discuss it a little bit more during office hours. I want to thank everybody for attending the lecture, and um, we'll catch you next time, students.